Okay, so hi everyone and thanks for joining this conference. It's a great honor for me to be here today to introduce this first event organized as part of my activity as a, plan a Planetary Health Campus Ambassador, thanks to the support of Planetary Health Alliance and Ghislieri College. Considering that this is the first event organized as part of this project, I would like to spend a, a brief introduction about what is Planetary Health and about the role of Planetary Health Alliance. Okay. During the last century, humanity has made um, tremendous public health gains by traditional measures such as um, global child mortali mortality and life expectancy. For example, we saw a um, steady decline of uh, global child mortality and at the same time, we uh, see an improvement of life expectancy really significant. At the same time, we have disrupted our planet. Uh, there are several anthropogenic environmental changes that are uh, caused by human activities during uh, last century. Some of them are listed there, for example, biodiversity loss, uh, change in land use and land cover, global pollution, climate change, and so on and so forth. And this is a great problem because science tells us that, that these environmental changes severely affect our health and pose the risk to jeopardize decades of public health gains. For example, uh, some of these negative uh, um, effects on, on our health of these uh, um, activities include cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, if you consider, for example, um, air pollution, uh, infectious zoonotic and diarrheal disease, uh, heat strokes, considering the extreme heat waves we are facing uh, all over the world, and so on and so forth. So uh, the question is, what can we do to uh, sort out this problem? I think that one prom a promising and uh, um, important uh, possible solution is represented by planetary health. Planetary health is a new transdisciplinary and solution-oriented field that uh, um, has um, the aim to understand and quantify the growing human health impacts of anthropogenic global environmental change, so to study the link between human health and environmental health, but also to act uh, by projects that uh, will reduce these uh, um, negative effects of our action in order to improve our, improve our general health. In this sense, it is important to note that by arming our natural system, we arm, uh, we arm ourselves and future generations. And it is essential to uh, remember that uh, um, nowadays we have to consider human health as intrinsically related to um, planetary health, to the health of our planet. Otherwise, we uh, could face serious uh, risk and uh, we could uh, uh, jeopardize every um, achievement we uh, obtain during last century. So uh, in 2070, uh, Planetary Health Alliance was uh, created and now it is an or uh, a consortium of over 260 organizations uh, committed to understand and advance the field of planetary health. Here you can find uh, informational resources and educational resources about planetary health and uh, the uh, linkages between human health and the health of our planet, but also a possibility to um, be engaged in the activity of the association. For example, for uh, students, uh, the Planetary Health Campus Ambassador Program, or for clinicians, clinicians for planetary health. I would like to thank really much Planetary Health Alliance for this opportunity given to me as Planetary Health Campus Ambassador. It is a privilege and uh, um, it is really important also for the realization of this conference. At the same time, I would like also to thank really much uh, uh, Collegio Ghislieri, a 450 year old College of Merit in Pavia, um, where I am a fellow student that uh, gave me the possibility to organize this conference and the future events we will uh, organize. Uh, it is extremely important and so I'm really happy for that. Today, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Desilabo. Professor Desilabo is a professor of uh, pediatric infectious disease at the University of Stanford. She is a leading expert of arboviruses. Specifically, uh, she, studied, uh, um, she studies the epidemiology and ecology of domestic and international arboviruses and emerging infections. Moreover, she studied the human health impacts of climate change, including research focus on innovative solutions to the global plastic pollution crisis. Thank you very much, Professor Desilabo, to accept our invitation. It is an honor for us to start this uh, project with such an important event. So thank you very much again. Thank you so much for the stop, invitation. Uh, uh, sharing my screen. Okay, Perfect. so you know, okay. I will share mine. Let's see here. Can you see it okay? Yes. Okay, Perfect. wonderful. It's so lovely to be with you all today. Thank you for coming. I know it's your evening. 
Um, and I'm so glad to kick off this important event with the Planetary Health Alliance. And Luca, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks. I wish I was with you in person in Pavia. <laughs> I've never been. Someday, I hope. Okay. So today, I'm going to talk to you um, about our work in arboviruses and the intersection with climate change and then also um, sort of climate justice. And when I'm giving this talk, I can't see you very well. So if anybody has a question and wants to stop me and get some clarification, please feel free. You know, we're on Zoom. We can be slightly um, less formal. And then at the end, there'll be also time for questions if you have any. Um, but I probably won't be able to see you very well. So, Luca, I'm going to give you can be the ambassador for my talk as well in case anybody has any questions or anything. Thank Sorry. you. All right. So um, the objectives today are really to understand the mechanisms um, by which climate change actually promotes the emergence of vector borne diseases. And I'm going to illustrate the association of temperature change on risk of both malaria and dengue using some of our clinic based fever surveillance in Kenya, where I've been working for about 20 years. We're going to define the steps that the health sector can take to become prepared to address some of these shifting geographic burdens. And then in the end, I'm also going to touch on the plastic pollution crisis and how that impacts health and what we've tried to do about that. I like to begin, and that was a great introduction, Lika, because um, I want to begin actually talking a little bit about One Health and planetary health, right? We are part of a very interconnected web of life, and climate change shifts all of the natural systems. So the range, the life cycle, growing patterns, disease dynamics of many living organisms are actually affected by a changing climate. And of course, our health, human health, is inextricably linked to the health of all the other um, organisms on the planet. And so people use the terms, you know, one health or planetary health approaches to really talk about that inclusive holistic view and how it's important to take that approach when you're trying to evaluate the effects of climate change on human health. And so that's what I'm going to do today as I talk about arborvirology. I don't know if many of you know, but mosquitoes are actually the most deadly animal on the planet. And that is, of course, because they carry pathogens that kill and pathogens that maim people, right? So people can die from, from these pathogens and they can also be sick for a very long time and suffer very long um, health consequences from them. And so I study a particular group of those pathogens is called arboviruses, which stands for arthropod born virus. And these are viruses that require a blood sucking arthropod to complete their life cycle. Many of them are zoonotic, and so they impact humans and animal populations. And we know of many, many of these viruses. I've just put a few of the, um, their life cycles on, on this um, page here. At the top is dengue, and then there's West Nile, which is very important in the United States and also in Italy, and then um, a Rift Valley fever virus at the bottom. So the question is, how is climate change going to affect, affect vector-borne disease transmission? Well, of course... Disease vectors are ectotherms, right? They are intrinsically temperature dependent. Um, and so you can imagine that a warming planet is going to have a big impact on the biology of a disease vector. And what we're looking at here is our warming planet, right? So these, this is just a map showing um, over the last 100 years or so the planet and its warming. And when you see it get to dark red there, that's when um, the area has hit 2 degrees Celsius. And that is the temperature change that ecologists think are going to be very impactful for the ecosystems on our planet. And so when people think of climate change, many think of this, right? The polar bear on his shrinking ice cap. And this is definitely true, right? Burning fossil fuels leads to increased temperature, which then leads to ice mass loss and sea level rise and shifts in flower and plant blooming, all which can have an impact. But it also leads to alteration in mosquito habitat. So at the end of this talk, I, I want you to recognize that climate change, you know, causes extreme weather events, warming temperatures, and don't just think about that polar bear on a shrinking ice cap. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about vector borne diseases and mosquitoes and how that's impacted with climate change. And if we look at the outbreaks over the last few decades, many of them actually have been um, vector borne disease. And why is that? Well, we live in a very modern world now where, um, we live in an urban world. Many people have moved from the rural rural areas into the urban areas, right? With that comes a lot of change in mosquito habitat and can cause disease emergence for arboviruses. We also change the planet. We deforest, we reforest, we 
we irrigate, right? All of that changes mosquito habitat. And unfortunately, there's a lot of military activities in war, which of course stops any sort of surveillance or control that was going on before the war began. We have fairly a small toolkit when it comes to vector control. And then we live in a very connected world where we have very increased transportation, right? So you can get anywhere in the planet within about 24 hours. And of course, these viruses can be carried with, with you. And then climate change has impacts. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So there's warming temperatures, natural disasters and extreme weather events that can all take a toll, and then a reduced capacity to sustain clean water. So definitely we've all noted and that extreme weather events are more frequent, right? And so my favorite virus is actually Rift Valley fever virus. And it is very climate connected because outbreaks of rift begin when there's flooding like this in East Africa, um, because the floodwater 80s already have the virus and they bloom and initiate this outbreak, which then finds its way to humans through animal populations. Um, this is just a picture of where we work in Kenya, um, one of the, the homesteads there in the dry season and the rainy season, right? So clearly extreme weather happens. And we've been working in Kenya for a long time. And I'm going to talk to you right now about a study we did a few years back where we were enrolling children with fever at four sites in Kenya, two along the coast um, of Lake Victoria and two along the Indian Ocean coast in South Kenya. And at that time, we were, you know, measuring, fe measuring febrile illness in children, trying to understand why they were coming in sick with fevers, checking them for malaria and mosquito-borne viruses like dengue and chikungunya. And we were also measuring climate. So we were doing temperature, rainfall, and humidity measurements daily. And then we were also trapping mosquito vectors at all life stages. And you can see here um, all the different ways that we were trapping mosquito vectors. And we were trying to link climate with increased vector abundance and increased disease risk for dengue and chikungunya. And so this work was done by Cameron, who was actually a Stanford student. And he used satellite climate data and tried to classify months as really high rainfall or really low rainfall, or really hot or really cold, right? So floods, droughts, heat waves, and cold waves. And then he compared the average vector abundance in cases of dengue in our child cohorts following extreme climate months. And what did he find? Well, he actually found that floods were associated with vector abundance and an increased higher risk of dengue. And this sort of makes sense, right? Because you, you know that the mosquito life cycle needs water. And so floods fill up, you know, a lot of plastic containers around. And these mosquitoes love to breed in plastic containers. And so it makes sense that floods might be associated. But interactions between climate change and infectious disease, particularly vector-borne disease, are actually complex and fairly poorly understood. So we know chikungunya is also spread by the same vector as dengue, Aedes aegypti, which prefers to breed in man-made containers like these here. But it turns out in 2004-05, there was a very large outbreak of chikungunya on the Kenyan coast, and it was actually linked to drought, not floods. So how could this be? Well, it turns out that unusually dry, warm conditions preceded the outbreaks. And so many people did not have access to safe, reliable water. So they were housing water in these unsafe containers, right, which actually became a breeding factory for these types of mosquitoes that love to breed in those containers. So you can see both floods and droughts can lead to these arboviral outbreaks. And this really does underscore the need for safe water storage during drought relief operations and just in general. So this is a conceptual model for the nonlinear relationship between rainfall and vector abundance. And we're going to be talking about a lot of nonlinear relationships today. So you can see when there's no water and there's drought and people are re relying on artificial containers to store water because they don't have safe, reliable access to clean water, you can see that you can get a lot of vector abundance there, right? Because the, the um, mosquitoes love to breed in those containers. And then you can imagine with a lot of rainfall, right, like we were talking about, you can see floods. You can actually at the top of this curve, you can also see increased risk. And then you can imagine that if it really keeps raining, maybe there would be flushing of those larvae and then a decreased risk of these diseases again. But it's quite complicated, right? And in order to get diseases, um, which is here at the bottom, you need a susceptible host, you need a competent vector that has the parasite or the virus in it, and then that vector and host actually need to come together. And that is dependent on vector distribution and host distribution. And you can see that environmental drivers impact a lot of these different levels. And climate change itself impacts many of these levels, right? The competence of the vector, which we're going to talk about in a bit, that vector and host coming together, and then the distribution of the vector and the host. 
So back to our question, how's climate change going to affect vector-borne diseases? Well, it used to be, um, this was published back in 2000, and this was the, uh, a prediction of the risk of malaria transmission by 2020 with a warming climate. And what you can see there in red is that the risk is going to get so much worse in the United States and then across Europe. You see Italy there. Um, and this was all based on the idea that with an increasing temperature, there would just be a linear association and an increasing rate of malaria transmission. But this, of course, did not happen. And the reason why it didn't happen is because of mosquito biology and physiology, right? It turns out that it's not a linear association. It's actually a unimodal association, right? So you can imagine at any mosquito trait that is temperature dependent, and there are many of them, I'll show you in a bit, but any mosquito trait is going to have a temperature where it's too cold for that trait to occur optimally and it's too warm. And there's going to be a temperature where the biology works perfectly, right? And for each mosquito, this is actually different. And so when you look at the planet and you think about a changing planet, it actually, the, the rate at which vector-borne diseases may change actually depends on how warm it is where you started, right, and how warm it's going to get. And so you can imagine if you're down here around 16 degrees and it warms up a little bit, maybe there isn't going to be such an increased risk of transmission for you. Versus if you're on this part of the curve and it increases two degrees, right, you may actually have a significant increase in the risk and the p potential for a lot of vector borne disease transmission. If you're already at the optimum, maybe things won't change too much, but if you're already past the optimum temperature and it gets even warmer, you can imagine that actually an increasing temperature might actually decrease vector borne disease risk where you live. So it's quite nuanced. And there's many different mosquito species, right? There's the 80s mosquitoes, 80s mosquitoes that we're talking about today, which spread Zika and chikungunya and dengue and yellow fever that like to breed in containers and bite during the daytime. There's the Anopheles vectors, which are the malaria vectors, also spread on yang yang and bite at night, which is why the mosquito nets actually um, protects you. And then there's Culex mosquitoes, which spread West Nile and Japanese encephalitis and rift, and they love to feed on animals too, right? So each mosquito also has its own traits um, that are important for disease transmission. And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to understand how temperature impacts all of these traits in the mosquito and then leads to disease spread, which we're interested in predicting. And so it's a lot of math, right? You can see here, this is the r naught for vector-borne disease. And I'm not a huge, huge fan of math. Um, so I like to think about it like this. There are many temperature-dependent traits in these mosquitoes, and some of them are related to the mosquito life cycle, right? So it turns out that when it's warmer, the mosquito lays more eggs, the adults live longer, the, 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 the time it takes for the eggs to get to adults is a little bit shorter, so the mosquito development rate is shorter, and then the egg-to-adult survival rate is higher. Um, mosquitoes also like to bite us a little bit more when it's warmer outside, and it turns out that the parasite or the, the pathogen, the, the virus inside the mosquito develops faster when it's warmer and the mosquito is more competent to transmit disease. So our approach is really to take all of this data, these physiological responses, right, and create these curves. And this is done with Erin Mordecai, who's a biology math modeler at Stanford. And she calculates the the R0 versus temperature, like I've just shown you. And then I'm a field epidemiologist and a physician. And so we like to take our field data with humans and actually try and vi va validate these ecological models and then project under a future climate. And there's a picture of Aaron right there, my friend who loves math. So first, I just want to show you some of our data with malaria. So as I mentioned, malaria is, you know, one of the most important vector-borne diseases in the world, right? Um, culling more than 400 um, million children per year. And there are many, many temperature-dependent traits for um, Anopheles, which is the mosquito vector. And so Aaron um, knew that you know, there was a prior estimate. People thought that malaria transmitted most around 32 degrees, okay? But then she looked at all of the mosquito data in the labs and actually created this new ecologic curve showing that actually the peak malaria transmission is actually 25 degrees a lot lower than what was previously predicted. And this is important because when you're trying to predict the changes of a warming climate, you need to know these optima for these mosquito species. And so what we wanted to do 
is really test this model and find out, does the temperature effect predicted by this ecological model really applicable to malaria incidents in our clinic? And so we went back to our outpatient sites in Kenya where we're enrolling children with febrile disease, about 6,000 of them. And we asked that question, you know, um, how does the temperature really impact malaria disease in these kids? And so if we look at our four different sites, you can see in Chilimbo, which is the rural west side, we had 83% of febrile children actually had malaria smear positive or malaria smear positive had malaria in their blood versus about 50 to 60% in the other sites. And the temperatures, we were clocking the temperatures at all these different sites, and they were different. It's a little bit warmer on the coast than on the west side. And so I had a postdoc fellow, Melissa Shaw, who really evaluated the effect of 30-day mean temperature on smear positivity rates at our clinic sites. And so she controlled for rainfall, for bed net use, for sex and age and socioeconomic status. And look what she found. So when you look at this curve here, the smear positivity rate in our clinics actually peaked at 25 degrees Celsius, which is exactly what Erin predicted in her ecologic model. So our field data was able to validate that ecologic prediction. And when we looked at our four sites, Chilimbo, which was that site that had the most malaria, those temperatures were usually around 25 degrees at that site versus the coast, Masambuena and Acunda, where it was a little warmer for them most part times of the year. And you can see that the rates were lower and paralleled this curve perfectly. So really exciting data. So what does this mean in the grander scheme of things when we look across Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, it's not that malaria is just going to spread everywhere and the world is going to get impacted with malaria. It's that there's going to be this shift in burden of malaria. And so you can see here the burden of malaria in Africa now. And so what we predict with a warming planet is that malaria burden will actually shift across the planet. And there will be less malaria burden in some places because it will actually get a little too hot. Um, for malaria. And what about the other infections? So I'm, I study malaria because I have to. I work in Sub-Saharan Africa and it's still a big problem. But these are my true loves, right? Dengue, chikungunya, Zika, these arboviral infections. So what's going to happen with them with a warming planet? Well, as you can imagine, Aedes aegypti, which is the vector we've been talking about, and then Aedes albopictus, which is a sister vector, which is actually very common in Italy, as you can see there. Um, but most of these vectors spread a lot of these um, mosquito-borne viral infections like dengue and chikungunya and so forth. And so both of them have their own little curves regarding all of these temperature-dependent traits in the mosquito. And it turns out they have slightly different temperature optima. So Aedes albopictus, the one that you have a lot of in Italy, likes it cooler also, like the malaria vector around 25 degrees. But Aedes aegypti, um, which is really the worldwide transmitter of these, these viruses, likes it quite hot and peaks around 29 degrees. So when we go back to our outpatient sites in Kenya, 6,000 kids with fever, and we know there's this malaria curve, the Anopheles curve in yellow here, and then the dengue curve, the Aedes aegypti curve in red, we know that there's these different temperatures. So we went back to our clinics and said, well, can we plot malaria and dengue on these curves and do they follow these, these curves? And it turns out that non-malarial fever actually also follows the curve, the red curve, right? So I already showed you the malaria fever following that yellow curve. And you can see, of course, there's a lot of overlap, but it is interesting looking just at climate alone, right, that you can see this parallel with temperature and disease transmission. So what about the rest of the world with dengue? Well, as the world warms, again, the dengue mosquito likes it quite hot. So you can see there's just going to be more and more of the planet that is able to allow dengue transmission year round, right? more and more red there all across the tropics and bleeding into past the 10 degree isotherms. And so um, a warming planet is gonna be, you know, very good for 80. And so it turns out when we ask that question, how's climate change gonna shift disease burden? It really depends on the disease you're talking about and the vector that you're talking about that spreads that disease. Because each one of these vectors has its own temperature optimum, right? And so you can see here, we've just plotted some of them there. But um, depending on the diseases that you're worried about, um, it's a very nuanced shift in the amount of transmission of these diseases as you look at a warming planet. And when we talk about what's going to happen where I work in Kenya and dengue burden, you, I showed you already that malaria burden is going to shift as the climate changes. Dengue burden is just going to grow and grow and grow across Africa. 
And this is actually very important because right now there is no diagnosis of dengue um, in, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, and there's very little healthcare provider information about it, um, and there's no vector control against it. So mainly people are focused on dealing with the malaria vector, which is very different in bites at night, and there isn't really any vector control right now. And so we need to take this information, know that there's a potential for more disease as time goes on, and be able to use it to really pull resources into a more integrated vector management and clinician and layperson education around these diseases as they become more common. So when we look at our big three um, monsters here, these mosquito monsters for human disease, Aedes likes 29, Anopheles likes 25, and Culex likes 23. So again, very nuanced. So this is a big challenge for the world, right? Because these viruses are moving around. We have non-immune populations. There's vectors that are very competent in different parts of the world and are just waiting for the virus to come in. Um, and we, in many places, don't have a lot of local testing that's happening and very limited physician knowledge and suspicion, and therefore poor diagnostics and no ability to use diagnostics to rule in other diseases, right? And unfortunately, at this time, no treatments or widely available vaccines. So what do we do about this? Well, we need to grow infrastructure and grow mosquito control to prevent outbreaks. We need to address the research gaps, find better diagnostics that can be used on the ground at the patient in real time, um, better vaccines and targeted therapeutics, and then track disease better to really understand how climate change is going to impact vector-borne disease and improve the prediction so that we can actually, you know, um, use that information for pre preparation and preparedness across different continents. And it would be great to be able to locally establish early warning systems so that limited resources can be directed towards what's most important at that time. So what can health professionals do? Well, I think we're actually uniquely poised to promote resilience in these climate-related stressors, recognizing that not all individuals and communities are really impacted equally by climate change. We need to recognize that disease vectors and diseases are expanding in the range and really stay curious and open to new diagnoses. Um, we need to investigate patient risk and take time for guidance and really work across professional lines, right? We brought up One Health and, and Planetary Health at the very beginning, but it's really important to stay in contact with other professionals so that we can get a more holistic um, idea of how climate change is going to impact these diseases because it's not just going to be humans. It's going to be all of the living organisms on our planet. And so taking keys from, from other professionals who are working in those other ecosystems is really key. And we need to build climate resilience, right? And a lot of this comes down to health equity to really understand that climate change impacts different populations differently and really promote policymaking that improves health and decreases health inequities. But human behavior also really matters, right? So I spent the first half of my talk talking about climate in on its own, right? Just climate impacting vector risk and then disease risk, vector abundance and disease risk. But it's not just climate, right? Human behavior matters quite a bit. I talked to you about how humans move around, right? This is how we, how we move viruses with us. A lot of these viruses are asymptomatic. You may not even be sick, and then you take the virus with you to a new place. And if the vector's there, you can initiate your own outbreak. Humans move. As you can see, this is just 24 hours of air traffic. As I said, it's a very small world where these viruses cross borders all the time. And so we need to think about it like that. And then we change our planet in lots of ways, right? And what I want to talk about for a little bit is the plastic pollution crisis. So this is plastic. And in our work, we actually figured out through doing a school intervention when we, we were we were teaching kids that there were different types of mosquitoes and that um, it's not just the malaria mosquito. We're working in Kenya. It's not just the malaria mosquito that bites you at night. There's actually day biting mosquitoes. And, you know, this is what the mosquitoes look like. Go out and find them. And when we sent them out into their communities to find them, the, the immature mosquitoes, we said, you know, the next day they came back and we said, you know, well, did you find them? They said, yeah, we found them. And we asked, well, where did you find them? And they said, well, in all of the plastic trash breeding behind our households. And so we were conducting this, um, this intervention study and, you know, we quickly shifted gears and tried to do a lot of cleanup to deal with these containers that are breeding all these mosquitoes. Um, but this plastic really has a lot of impact on health. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, the impact on disease 
the fact that plastic waste creates breeding grounds for mosquitoes, right? And rodents, of course. But plastic also impacts health in other ways. So 75% of plastic in Sub-Saharan Africa is actually burned. And that, of course, contributes to air pollution and asthma and death from, from air pollution, which is about 6 million deaths in the world. Plastic is also a toxic pollutant, right? And it attracts hydrophobic pollutants. And so it's almost like a vehicle of bringing these pollutants into our bodies because we ingest microplastics all the time. Um, and they've now been found in our blood, but they're in our water, our salt, our food, our fish, everywhere, right? And so this has an, it can ha potentially have a harmful impact. And then, of course, plastic chokes our marine ecosystems, right? We, a lot of communities in the world depend on marine ecosystems um, for health and survival and food security. And so this, of course, not only is horrible for the marine ecosystems themselves, but impacts human health as well. So our research has shown that plastic waste and these other solid waste, like tires, really collect water and then create the ideal breeding ground for Aedes aegypti, this day-binding vector that we've been talking about that spreads dengue and chikungunya and yellow fever and Zika. And so over our work, you know, we've, we've um, tried to trap a lot of mosquitoes at these um, areas where a lot of plastic is held, housed called the yard shops. Um, in our um, villages in Kenya. And we found large, large, large numbers of mosquitoes um, breeding in these places. And this is very close to where humans live. And of course, that leads to um, a lot of exposure to the viruses we've been talking about. So in Kenya, where I work, more than 50% of the community are exposed to dengue and chikungunya um, because there are so many mosquitoes biting them. And so what do we know? Well, we know that these are bad pathogens. They're spread by this mosquito that likes to breed in plastic and these kind of unused containers close to human settlements. Um, and we know that our studies have shown that this plastic waste is associated with these diseases. And we know that intervention studies with strong plastic waste components have been really effective at controlling Aedes aegypti in other parts of the world. And so what we did was we started to, we, we, um, got funded to do this project called Trash to Treasure, where we're trying to collect this trash and really put it into um, an economy, a circular economy, um, to actually improve the economic living for people there, but also to reduce these vector breeding sites. Um, and I just want to mention here, in Kenya, there's no formal recycling. And so reducing and recycling and a reuse of solid waste is actually quite minimal. And 60% of the waste just ends up on the streets, right, leading to a lot of environmental and public health problems. So we definitely wanted to do something about this. But we see an opportunity here because if uncollected trash is increasing disease, then cleaning up trash could actually reduce disease. But again, this isn't happening right now. But we know that trash collection and recycling could provide opportunities for jobs and livelihoods and economic growth in the area, which is really, really needed. Um, and we know that there's a model for this because glass and metals are recycled nearly 100%. And so our project objectives are really to assess the potential for community-based recycling that engages aspiring entrepreneurs to repurpose trash for profit and then try to improve the health by reducing arboviral disease transmission and then alleviate poverty by generating income. And so what we're doing here is really just creating a circular economy of plastic waste collecting trash, giving it a purpose, selling it, and then reinvesting those profits to collect more trash, right? And in the end, this would reduce disease transmission and decrease poverty. But we met a lot of roadblocks, right? So we did a lot of listening at the beginning of our study, like we normally do. And through focus group discussions and in-depth interviews with all the different people in the informal recycling trade of plastic in Kenya, we found that there were a lot of problems. So the infrastructure wasn't really sufficient for storing trash. Community members didn't see any value in trash and actually stigmatized the handling of trash. And then the yard shop operators, which were sort of the middlemen, faced a lot of challenges in their work and the policy didn't really support a culture of recycling. And so what normally happens in Kenya is these waste collectors sell the waste to these yard shop operators. And then they sell them to traders or middlemen, which then sell it on to these recycling plants in Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya, um, to do a couple of different things and repurpose that waste. But we went to work in the middle here at the yard shop operators and really understand how we could improve their business models so that we could really kind of grease the wheels of this system and try and get more plastic off the street. 
But again, they had a lot of challenges. Their businesses were very like fluctuating and volatile. They were getting a lot of harassment from the county government. There were policy limitations, so a lot of taxes and levies, not really a culture or policies that supported this business trade. And then there were specific health risks working with the trash. And they were purely at that time motivated just on, you know, making enough money to feed their families. They didn't really see themselves as um, providing a lot of environmental health um, for their communities by picking up the waste and housing it safely where they were. And so our approach was to do this project and create a business incubator pro program for these yard shop operators and train them to improve their business management skills, strengthen their relationships with key stakeholders in the government, and then provide a lot of um, training on health and safety, waste sorting practices, and then keeping that waste safe and covered, right, from rainwater so that they weren't actually providing breeding grounds for mosquitoes in their neighborhoods. And so over time, this project led to a de an increase in plastic waste recovered, which is great. So less plastic on the street, less fluctuations in prices, a really strong peer network, and then significant reductions in ages of drift eye breeding in these neighborhoods. But a lot more action was needed, right? So there was still the whole community at large who didn't really use a lot of recycling behavior and it was really um, still stigmatizing trash, right? So we needed to promote those behaviors and reduce that stigma. We wanted to improve the waste infrastructure and really streamline recycling operations. We really want to create a market for all of this plastic and recycled plastic products and then change the policies, right, to really support a shift in mindset and create this a really recycling culture, right? And so that's why we decided last year to actually launch a nonprofit. So we're still trying to do a lot of work as researchers, but we recognized that we needed another way to affect change in our communities on this plastic pollution crisis, because we knew that pollution was choking the planet and the people where this lack of safe water, which I started with at the very beginning of my talk, and really poor sanitation led to these infectious diseases and other environmental health risks. And again, this is all exacerbated by the fact that there's a lot of stigma. And so what we're hoping with this nonprofit is that we're going to translate the power of all the scientific knowledge we've gained over the decades into engaging messages that are actionable in the community and can change the trajectories of health for the people and the planet. And so this is where we're working on the south coast of Kenya, and it's actually a perfect place to do this work because we're on the Indian Ocean coast. And so people love the ocean. They recognize it as needing to keep it healthy for the health of themselves and their families and their communities. And so um, right here, we have this perfect convergence of being able to, you know, deal with the plastic pollution crisis so that it doesn't impact the oceans. And then it doesn't impact the air because it isn't burned. And then it doesn't impact our land and our people and cause all these vector-borne diseases. And so I launched this nonprofit with my two long-term Kenyan collaborators, Dr. Matuku in the middle and Dr. Ndenga on the far right. We've been working together on vector-borne diseases in Kenya. They're actually entomologists. They're Kenyan entomologists um, for a really long time. And so we launched this nonprofit. And initially, we started with quite a small CBO, which stands for Community Business Organization. But now it's more than doubled in size. And these are all local folks who really care about sustainability and exactly what the Planetary Alliance is going for, right? Making our planet healthy and safe so that we can thrive and then so can all the other um, species on the planet. And so this new nonprofit, um, and HARI, by the way, stands for the Health and Environmental Research Institute, Kenya. So we're really kind of trying to inspire community education, new research, policy change, and this grassroots activism in environmental health issues. And we're hoping that by building this education and awareness and really empowering local communities to change their cultural norms when it comes to recycling, that we're going to be able to clean up local environments and create jobs while doing so, and then also decrease these mosquito-borne and trash-related health risks, right, to improve the health of people. And so our first five goals are to build this community of engaged stakeholders, strengthen and foster relationships, empower and educate youth and community members about the dangers of trash, and then remove a lot of plastic waste before it's burned or gets into the oceans, and then cultivate this plastic recycling culture. And again, what we're trying to do is get away from this linear kind of extractive, consumptive economy and world that we have and create this circular economy 
um, where we're using less and what we're used is put back into local products that could be sold and improve um, that really the economic outlook for a lot of people on the ground. And I just like to show this. This is one of my dreams. Um, so we're doing this right now. You know, we, we're writing grants still. We're collecting philanthropic dollars and donations from our website, but we're trying to really empower a lot of local women to take up these um, recycling jobs because right now most of the jobs are held by men. And um, I have come in contact with this um, G8 universities in the UK who have created this antimicrobial fuel cell. So right here, this is called the H2AD. It costs about $250,000. And what this thing does is it uses um, a bacterium to create energy, okay? So we all know that plastic is made from fossil fuels. And so there's a, it's made out of oil, right? So there's a lot of potential biologic energy in that plastic. But we're not able to get at it because it's really hard to break those initial bonds. Well, it turns out in 2016, a bacterium called Iconella sakiensis was um, identified in the trash heaps of Japan and was found that it actually naturally breaks down plastic, particularly PET plastic, your water bottle plastic, um, for its food source. And so what this unit does is it actually takes this PET plastic, right? You chip it up, you chop it up, and you put it into this plastic reactor. And then it transforms the plastic into two things. It makes a digestate, which is this fertilizer, which can be used on crops, a really rich fertilizer. And it creates gas, a methane-rich gas, which can be harnessed to power things. And so what we like to do is take all of this plastic and transform it into an aquaponics unit. So to power an aquaponics unit where we can grow, you know, sustainably farmed fish, um, so that we're not overfishing the oceans, um, and then actually grow up um, medicinal plants and vegetables as well in this sort of circular economy way. So I'm closing now. I just want to tell you, so I talked about some unmeasured factors in arborology today. I talked about how solid waste breeds um, are really mosquito breeding factories in many parts of the world. We talked about the built environment and how the environmental context of our work is very important. Um, I talked a lot about governance, education, control programs, policies, and how those impact um, our work. And then I didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but the structural factors, right? Violence, health, inequities, and poverty, and how those play into arborology. Um, and many arboviruses are actually, I like to think of them as neglected tropical diseases, right? These are viruses that impact impoverish more severely and promote poverty, right? By causing these long lasting sequelae. And so we're really trying to partner with communities to target problems that matter and making sure that our work has relevance and purpose on the ground. And that's so we can slowly uncover and then break down these structural determinants of health, these health inequities that really create these patterns of disease. And I think climate change is just going to exacerbate all of these existing inequities more and more and more. And vector-borne diseases are impacted by all of these different colored boxes here. We, we um, vector-borne diseases are really um, at the nidus of a lot of these different climate change impacts on health. And so it's really important that we tackle these health inequities so that we can, you know, slowly bring everyone together to not suffer the consequences and mitigate the harm of, of climate change. And so I like to say global health practitioners and researchers are really um, health and equity revolutionaries. And this is because we're first and foremost very climate focused, right? Our work, as I've talked to you today for almost an hour, very intricately tied to the climate because of our environmental context. We're very connected with our communities on the ground. We're in close relationship with our communities, and that helps us uncover some of these health inequities. Um, we're jumped by, by just default systems thinkers because arborology already brings together so many different systems, right? The vector and the host, the pathogen and the environment, right? So we're already at the nexus of complex systems. So we have to think that way. And I think that's important to tackle these climate change, global health problems. And then finally, we're very proximate, right? Like I'm a field epidemiologist, so I'm close to the problems. And I, I see every day all of the inequities. And so that sort of lights a fire in your belly to want to change things, right? So to conclude, 
Climate is important for determining where and when conditions are suitable for transmission of these vector-borne diseases. Climate change is going to exert a nuanced effect on vector-borne disease transmission, depending on the location. And it's probably going to promote a shift from malaria to arboviruses in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa. But the degree to which climate suitability translates into disease also depends on a lot of other factors, right? Pathogen exposure history, housing type, vector control, public health efforts, human mobility, and human behavior and global health inequities. I talked about some of those today. I talked about the global plastic crisis and its impact on health and environment. And we're hoping that this nonprofit, Harry, is going to tackle some of these problems through education, awareness, and active engagement with local communities. I think that global health practice and research really does provide a foundation of stakeholder relationships that can promote local health issues, planetary health issues, and tackle global health inequities. So I'd like to just thank my team. This is part of my team that I work with in Kenya. Um, I have a lot of partners at Stanford um, that I work with. Um, our funding sources, I have a lot of partners across Kenya and in other universities. Um, and I always want to thank my um, all of our, our research participants because without them, we could never have anything to say and we wouldn't be learning um, alongside them to help improve health. And then I want to thank you for your attention and for um, the opportunity to talk to you on Zoom in Italy today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and uh, uh, also for sharing your project about uh, plastic pollution because I think it perfectly aligned to the idea of planetary health of a transdisciplinary and solution-oriented approach in order to face uh, the problem of our society also from a, a starting from a scientific perspective. So if uh, someone has uh, uh, questions about, uh, um, about the conference, uh, you can turn on your camera or if you prefer you can uh, uh, write uh, in chat questions. Thank you very much. It looks like Miro Emanuel has his hand up. Please, please ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, so hi, uh, hi Professor. Uh, my name is Miro Emanuel. Nice to meet I don't you. Know if you can hear me. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm, in, yeah. I'm a medical student from Uganda next to Kenya. Yeah. I'm a uh, well. planetary health ambassador there at a uh, university, Mbara University. And I think some of my colleagues have attended your discussion. I want to thank you for breaking down such a complex topic in a simple way. Uh, and I want to thank you for the amazing work that you are doing in Kenya. Uh, I have about three submissions to make. Uh, first of all, the problem of climate change and and these diseases, which are mosquito vector born, is really uh, important, as you said, and it is actually worse. Uh, if uh, living in uh, an endemic country for malaria, I can I can tell that uh, there is an increase in the number of these infections. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a problem of emerging resistance to the therapies which are usually used for malaria, the artemisinin-based therapies, and uh, the child mortality is still high from these infections. So uh, the gloom prediction that these infections are going to get more Uh oh, did we lose him? More and more common uh, is actually a very sad and needs urgent action of policymakers. So, uh, for example, there's less plastic, uh, there's less plastic and there's, there's better sanitation generally. You find that even homes which are far away from water sources still experience a high burden of malaria. So still the, the mosquitoes find a way of of going to places which are not near water sources. So we find homes which are living in hills still face similar challenges to maybe homes which are close to water sources. So uh, that's an interesting uh, maybe approach because in rural areas, the focus wouldn't be as much on, 
on uh, environmental sanitation, uh, maybe more of human behavior approaches. I wanted to get your input on that. If you have experience in rural areas in Kenya, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, then last, this is a request. So uh, I think many of my classmates and colleagues who are medical students would be interested in uh, having uh, more talks about infectious diseases and climate. Uh, it's very interesting. And uh, with your permission, I uh, would also request for access to your slides and recording of the meeting to share with our colleagues who are not who have not been able to attend at this moment. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Luca can help with that because I yes. think he um, yes. he recorded it. Um, so this is so cool because I didn't know. So you're actually in Kenya now at Moy. I didn't realize this was going to open up and you were a planet health ambassador for everywhere. So this is so exciting. So, oh my God, it's, it's wonderful to meet you. Um, I, so about rural versus urban, you, you asked, I heard that question. So definitely we've been working in, in rural areas. So we work in Musambwini and then also in Chilimbo. So, um, both of those areas are quite rural. Um, we actually find a lot of transmission of dengue and chikungunya in, um, in rural areas. Many people in the world think that dengue is an urban, like that Aedes, Aedes aegypti is an urban mosquito and that should be less common in the rural areas. But we've actually found in Kenya that, and, and have published data that, that actually we find a lot of transmission in the rural areas, sometimes even more than the urban areas. Um, we found a lot of dengue and chikungunya in both, on the west side in Kenya and then also on the coast in Kwale. And, um, a lot of that, a lot of our diseases in the health centers get um, mistaken for malaria, right? Because actually it turns out a lot of the children have co-infections. They actually have malaria, which is still a big burden, like you just mentioned. But then also um, they're having these other viruses as well. And so without really good diagnostics, we don't know what's happening. And so through the work, so I mentioned, I've been working in Kenya since 2003, um, and um, in, in, during that time, I've been working with a lot of universities and the Ministry of Health, right? So we work closely with the Ministry of Health, the Vector-Borne Disease Unit. Um, it used to be called the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, but that's changed um, the evolution. But um, um, also, we work with, right now, I, I showed you those pictures of Francis and Bryson. Um, um, Bryson is at um, Camry, the Kenya Medical Research Institute, and then Francis is actually at the Technical University of Mombasa on, on the South Coast. Um, but we've had um, partners in different universities. And so um, I just welcome your questions. And I think you also had something in there about policy change. I lost you for a little bit. It might have been my Internet. But, um, yes, we have to bring the policymakers with us. We have always um, been working alongside with the policymakers. They have a lot of problems they're dealing with, right? But just letting them know that this is another one that also needs some attention. Um, and um, we're, it's just incredibly important to bring the policymakers with us because it turns out that that is really, really important to drive um, human health impacts, right? And so, so um, we do work alongside our policymakers in Kenya. And I think um, Luca has my email too. You can feel free to like reach out and email me and maybe next time I'm in Kenya, um, we can meet. Perfect, thank you very much. I see Leonardo Agam. Okay. Hi. I think we can't hear you. Hmm. Do you want to type? Yeah, maybe you could type your question, Leonard. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, he's getting his headset on. Perfect. Maybe people who are still here, can you just type in the chat where you're from? Like, just so we could see maybe how, like, you know, where, what we have. It sounds like we have some people from Kenya, definitely Italy and Kenya, which is great. Those are my two favorite countries. <laughs> It looks like Derek has a question and Melvin, and then maybe Leonard, maybe you can, if you can't get your audio to work, maybe you can type your question in the chat. Oh, Derek's from Kenya too. 
Perfect. And it'll be great. Do you guys, do you have a question, Derek? You want to unmute and ask your questions? Yeah. This is Derek from Kenya. Hi. Hi. Great, great presentation. So uh, I've also been working with the chikungunya virus. And I was focusing on the genomic characterization. I was just wondering whether you think uh, climatic changes might affect the genomic characterization of the aboviruses currently in circulation and even the lineages. Because in some cases, in some areas you find uh, during certain seasons, uh, for example, dengue, dengue 3 is circulating at some point. At some point, you get another type, subtype, maybe dengue 1. So do you think uh, climatic changes affect this and even the, the, the genomic sequence of, of aboviruses? I'm personally working on chikungunya virus. Mm -hmm. And you have brought in an angle that uh, I hadn't uh, looked at. And I think now I'll I'll be looking at uh, the climatic changes and how this might affect the sequences. Do you think it it might have an impact? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it's it's because what you're drilling down to is like the molecular impacts of climate change, right? And so, you know, I've been talking about mainly sort of the macro impacts, right? Like the vector itself and the processes and the vector. But it's potential, it's it's possible, perhaps, that the different viruses themselves also are impacted, like on that molecular level, right? By temperature changes or what happens in in the milieu, right? So you can see that in the vector itself at different temperatures, maybe its biology and its chemistry is acting differently in those situations, right? Whether it's a temperature it likes or doesn't like and so forth, and that could impact the virus, potentially viral fitness, the virus, you know, breaking through all of the barriers in the mosquito, the midget barrier, the salivary barrier. And so it is an interesting thought, right? Like kind of setting up those biologic systems and seeing if you perturb the temperature, does something happen with those with those um, those uh, barrier transformations, right? Um, and then as far as the genetics, I don't know. I'm not sure it should have an impact on genetics, but I don't know, right? They're interesting, very interesting questions. And I'm really happy to hear that you're working on chikungunya um, in Kenya. And I hope that you reach out. We too are working on chikungunya, so it'd be great to to work together. Um, very interesting. Thank you for your comment and your question, Melvin. It looks like you have a question. Okay. Hello. It's really nice to meet you and thanks for having this wonderful session today. I'm Melvin Otieno from Kenya, um, the Planetary Health Eastern African Hub uh, leader. And it is really great that you shared a lot on what projects you're doing um, in relation to aboviruses. So my question uh, is that how have you determined the status of, let's say, house screening in community living in a malaria endemic area of the Western Kenya, for instance, now that you've been focusing in Kisumu, and also how have you uh, been able to evaluate the community's knowledge and perception on available interventions? And um, considering that uh, there is lack of knowledge as well, um, and at the same time, I, I have also another question, considering that uh, with the recent pandemic, what has been your opinion on the impact of COVID-19 on the number of cases of dengue and also other aboviruses. Thank you so much. And looking forward to your response. <laughs> Thanks, Melvin, for those questions. So, um, so how it's been so, um, you asked, how are we getting the information? So a lot of times we are doing like focus groups in our communities. Um, in some of the intervention studies, we've done like door to door intervention, educational interventions, and then knowledge, attitude, and behavior screens before and after the interventions. We've worked in schools. Most of the time, um, we spend a lot of time trying to understand what the baseline, what the baseline, um, um, sort of knowledge is, right? And then that way we can, we can, you know, help to build awareness to the next, um, you know, the next levels of, of awareness when it comes to these problems. Um, in right now, in the 
um, in the nonprofit, we are starting to think about holding focus groups again and trying to understand what people, you know, understand about health and the impacts of all these different mosquitoes. You know, people have learned, uh, everyone has incredible knowledge about malaria, right? People know about the vector. They know how to protect themselves. They know what the symptoms are. They know what to do. You know, everybody understands malaria, but these viruses, there hasn't been the same um, level of sort of community education about them yet, I'd like to say. And so it's sort of just bringing up that there are other vectors, other mosquitoes, and that you have to treat them differently and that they look a lot like malaria. And so um, um, it, it really comes down to at least what we're trying to do right now is community-based education. But I think there is going to be a role for more formal introduction into, you know, the school systems and school curricula. And then also working and partnering with the vector, um, with the, with the Ministry of Health, actually more formal public health education. Because as you know, I mean, I've been working in Kenya for about 20 years and over these years, we've seen more and more mosquito borne virus outbreaks over time, the dengue and chikungunya outbreaks happening and dengue almost like yearly in Mombasa, right? And so people are, you know, the news, the media, social media, like all of that is, you know, helping um, the local awareness to get more and more over the years. And so I think we can really kind of um, use that to help propel even more kind of control and community uptake of new interventions for disease. And then as far as COVID, um, so unfortunately, I can't, I can't tell you that because what happened during COVID is we were doing all of this surveillance for these diseases. But then with COVID, of course, we shut everything down, right? And so we have no idea what happened with our diseases during COVID. And we're just trying to support our teams and keep everyone safe in our community. Um, I think that, you know, COVID, when there were all of those, um, you know, all of the, the um, shelter in place and all of that, I think, you know, it depends if you have a lot of mosquitoes breeding in your home, you know, sheltering in place might not necessarily be a good thing for these diseases, right? If your home is safe and clean, then it could be okay, because maybe you're less likely to get exposed than if you were out doing your normal thing at your school or your markets or, or your place of business, right? And so it's hard to say. In many parts of the world, people have actually noted that there's been decreases of dengue um, in relation to COVID-19. And so that's interesting. Um, we've still been monitoring and we have over time seen decreases, but it's hard to say because there was that gap when we couldn't do any surveillance, right? Um, but I think that um, there are some silver linings of COVID, I'll say. One of them might be that people recognize that there are a lot of different infections out there that can be severe and cause harm and people are interested in sort of you know, infectious disease and epidemiology a little bit more than they were in the past. I don't know how long lived that will be. Um, I think that um, in some places, COVID also taught us that we all sort of have some agency when it comes to things. Like, you know, if I take my vaccine and I wear my mask and I make good choices and I wash my hands, I can keep me and my family safe, right? And so that builds like self-efficacy. And I think that's important in health because humans need to know that they can take, make choices that actually improve their health. And then that makes a difference, right? It's just not what the government's doing or not your circumstances always that determine everything about you. You can have some agency in your life and make good choices and that will help you and your family. So I think that's a little bit good. Um, and so I think we're just going to have to see, right? I wish, I hope that it, COVID actually inspires a lot of young, brilliant people to enter infectious disease and join and join me in my profession in in um, being disease epidemiologists and and trying to understand these things. Um, so I hope that that is a, a silver lining of COVID. But I think we're just gonna have to wait and see what all of the impacts are. Um, and then really quick, because I know we're out of time. I just because you brought up mal malaria too. We did. We are looking at a study of of um, how COVID actually impacted malaria treatment in Kenya, where we're working on the um, on the South Coast, where we have a lot of hospital data, because we've been following this data for many, many years. And during COVID, there were many children who we would have expected to come in for malaria treatment who did not come in. So there was this huge kind of um, missing group of kids who, you know, looking at all the prior years, most likely had malaria and didn't seek treatment, at least at the health center. Maybe they got it somewhere else. 
Um, but now that it's over, things are back to normal. So things have re-equilibrated and we're seeing the rates that we used to see pre-COVID now. But there was a, a period there where you worry that there are some children who might have suffered more because they didn't go to the hospital because there was, you know, a huge outbreak happening. So that's all I'll say. Thank you. And then it looks like I'm just going to read Agam Leonard's email. Um, let's see. He said, this is an awesome question. My few concerns. Okay. I did some projects on assessment of water and sanitation within the LIN Kisumu with WashPro and matter sanitation were at stake by then. Based on your research, did you establish any correlation between the sanitation situation and the distribution of the factors? Um, what were the recommendations on this? And probably were you able to reach out to the county government ministry and help on possible interventions? on the quest to translate knowledge into action. So absolutely the last part, yes, we're working with the Ministry of Health um, to change policy and to, yes, exactly, translate knowledge into action. Um, we do do, um, we, we um, when we do these household-based studies, we do a lot of um, uh, what we call, um, well, we do an assessment, like sort of an environmental assessment and we're looking for mosquitoes mainly, right? So we're looking for these larvae and these eggs of these mosquitoes. Um, but we also look at just like the, yes, in general, the sanitation situation, just like trash and, you know, um, um, a lot of the water, you know, access to water, um, the situation of the household. And um, we're able to link some of that to, to our vector-borne diseases. But absolutely, I do believe that, it does matter, sanitation and these vector-borne diseases, particularly like I talked about, like the, the plastic pollution situation. Um, and that, of course, ties into water because there's a huge connection here with water and access to water. Um, because if people had safe, reliable access to water, they wouldn't have these unsafe containers and then breeding these mosquitoes in their backyards, right? And so it very much is connected to water and sanitation. So thank you for that. And I'm glad you, you typed out your comment. I'm sorry we couldn't get your audio to work. Yeah, and then this last comment. So everyone who's still on this call, Melvin's comment. Um, our, our organization, Harry Kenya, please look us up. Um, please also look up my website. Feel free to email me. Um, for those of you, I also, also, I saw there was someone from Brazil. I also do work in Brazil. I work in Belo Horizonte. So if any of you are also planetary health leaders and are interested in, in, um, any of this work or I can, you know, email me, um, look on our website. We would love to partner with you. Um, I love the fact that there's these planetary health student ambassadors all across the world. I want to know all of you. I am knee deep, heart full in planetary health. And so thank you very much for your work. And please do reach out and stay connected. And then again, Luca, grazie for this. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much again. I'm sharing my email in, in order. Okay. So. Sorry about that. I'm facing. Okay, perfect. So, uh, if uh, uh, please free for everyone to uh, uh, ask me for the um, recording of the presentation, and also I will share the email uh, of a professor if you would like to. Sure. Okay, perfect. I put my email there, and then also for people <laughs> who want to look at the organization as well, I'll put that there. Um, yeah. And if you do, and then I can also put my lab website, which might be helpful um, in case people um, want that. Let me type that in here too. Uh, there's that. Perfect. Okay. 
Is there Thank any you. other questions? Uh, it is time for uh, one, one, one another question if uh, anyone has one. But I don't think so. Okay, so thank you very much again for accepting our invitation. It was a great pleasure also to have this. Uh, ah, no, we have another question. Sarah, Sarah do you want to ask your question real quick? Hi, and um, thanks very much. Um, just as there's a, a moment of time, um, I'm an infectious diseases um, trainee doctor in the UK, um, and I'm, I'm really sorry I missed the beginning. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of the um, recording. But I really enjoyed the end of your presentation, um, and it's fantastic to hear about um, the work that you're doing that's like linking up these two topics. Um, I'd say in the UK, there's relatively um, limited recognition of like the relationship between infectious diseases and environmental sustainability, and obviously COVID's changed that to some extent um, and I think um, one of the areas where it's getting more attention is in relation to um, personal protective equipment and plastics um, but the sort of epidemiological side um, and um, trying to address kind of the determinants of infectious diseases and planetary health is um, still limited and I just wondered um, it sounds like you're doing fantastic work with a variety of different people across the board. And I, I wondered um, what your experience is of engaging with clinicians. So sort of doctors, nurses, physios, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and trying to sort of like bring this topic to them, whether that's part of what you're doing at all. Absolutely. Um, yes. OK, so I want to say two things really quick. Um, first, before I forget, like in the nonprofit, we almost have like three groups that we're targeting or partnering with, I shouldn't say targeting, but like empowering and working with. The first is the community members, right? Empowering them to take this up, make jobs, improve their health, improve their environment and so forth. The other one, policymakers, which I've talked about, right? All the different policymakers, partners, right? Partner organizations who are also care about this and sustainability. Um, and then the middle one is actually the physicians and the scientists. So, like, we're very interested in um, making um, environmental health a more, in, like, a more well-known and important and connected thing in our health centers. And this is in Kenya, right, for the nonprofit, but then I'll talk about in the U.S. side in a second as well. Um, and then also just growing up the next generation of future leaders, right, people who are, like, interested in tackling these problems and really learn about it, um, you know, during their, you know, research or their internships and so forth, and then using um, – our, our healthcare providers who are often have good rapport in the community and people trust, right? Because you find them when you're most vulnerable, when you're sick and they help you. And so there's a lot of trust using them to actually talk about these other like environmental health issues and sort of getting the word out, right? And so that is the nonprofit has sort of like those three tiers of kind of people and not tiers, but you know, three sections of people we're trying to really partner with and work with. Um, on the US side, so at Stanford, um, I can just tell you personal experience. So at Stanford, I co-direct this climate health and equity task force. And what we're really trying, we're in the school of medicine and what we're trying to do is just what you said, Sarah. It's like, um, really kind of grow this up in the medical community because the medical community, I feel like is lagging behind, right? The ecologists, yes, you know, people who work in biodiversity for sure, but like the physicians, right? Again, play a key role. That's why I had that. I don't know if you saw it, but I had a slide in there about like, what can health professionals do, right? Because we really do have a, are really positioned as like voices and leaders in the community to, to actually bring a lot of these issues to light, um, and then and, and really show people how the climate is impacting their health. Um, and so we've worked, you know, there need to be curricular changes. Right. So people need as they're going through medical training in medical school and in residency and fellowship, they need to learn about what the connections are between climate and health impacts so that they make those connections and they know it and they can talk to their patients about it. So there's a lot of curricular changes and there's lots of those things happening at Stanford. There's a lot of, there's a huge active medical student group that has gotten curriculum changed in the medical school. And then there's also like programs across all the different fellowships on climate change and health impacts, right? Um, and then there's just reaching out to the physicians themselves, not just as spokespeople, but also as people who have power and agency to actually change how healthcare is done, right? Because we know that healthcare is actually a, um, huge proponent of greenhouse gases in the world, right? I think it's like up to like five to 8%, something like that. Most of that is scope three. It's all supply chain and so forth. And as an infectious disease physician, I just got off service this morning 
It's like I wear a bazillion throwaway gowns every week that I'm on service. It's terrible, right? We're just we need to actually actually weave in sustainable healthcare practices and all of that. And so that's part of it too. And so I feel like the health sector really has an important role to play here, both in a voice um, for the population and to get those messages out, but then also in the choices we make and how we do our job in our systems and organizations. And so I think a lot of that is coming to light and we all need to, you know, continue to work together to make it happen. Right. So thanks for that question. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much again. And thank for everyone who joins in this conference. It is wonderful that the people coming from different parts of the world joins this event. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning and, or good evening, depending on your good time. Good morning, good evening, good night. <laughs> exactly. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Ciao.